Yeah, thanks for showing up. Um, I want to tell you about, a bit about Akka today. Um, so time's short. I'm Michael. Hi. Let's get into it. Um, I will tell you today about Akka. Yeah, this is Akka. Uh, so basically, this is the Akka mountain. This is what Akka is uh, uh, basically called after. Um, what is Akka? Has anyone experience with Akka here? Anyone? Uh, okay, 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 okay. Um, I will go into the details a bit, but not too deep because it's only 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. What are the core concepts of Akka? Um, basically, what Akka provides is it uh, gives an implementation of the actor programming model for the JVM. Um, now, what is the actor programming model? It's nothing very new. It's something that's been around since the 70s, I think 73 or something it came up. Um, basically, the idea behind uh, actors is um, you have objects which basically can only communicate with each other by sending messages. Okay? So we don't call methods on each other, we don't wait to uh, get a result or something like that, we just call uh, uh, send messages to each other. Okay? So in a way, you can compare it with sending SMS. Okay? You have two objects that can just send an SMS to each other. The other object or actor might answer, it might not, it might answer after one day, it might, uh, it might never answer. Um, so yeah, this is a bit, it, need, it needs a bit uh, getting used to, but it allows for a very um, good parallelization because now you don't have to think about um, basically, can this code be called from multiple threads? It can only be, it will only run on one thread when you process a message, okay? And this, basically, prioritization comes by running multiple actors in parallel. And this is basically the idea why actors became pretty popular and uh, be, why we can, can solve very good with uh, asynchronicity and um, um, problems we have right now. Uh, what ACA also provides, and this is something that's also a part of the actor programming model in a way, is a good way of dealing with, with uh, faults or errors. Um, so ACA programs, uh, so each actor basically is, um, is shielded from the others. So if one actor fails, um, it will not take the whole system down, just this actor fails, and you can deal with, that, uh, with restarting that or doing whatever with this actor to get the system up and running. Um, this is something that's really, really good if you need resilient systems. So one of the premier examples of actor programming is Erlang. Uh, you might have heard of that language. And basically, Erla if Erlang is known for one thing, it's basically that you are able to build very, very resilient software with that. And basically, this fault tolerance model is um, responsible for that. Um, in Akka, this fault tolerance is uh, implemented in a way that you don't um, you deal with errors in a different, basically in a different mode. So you have a control flow where the messages are sent between actors and the errors don't propagate back to the sender, they propagate back into a hierarchy basically. So you have parental supervision, okay? Each parent is responsible for their children and needs to clean that up. And in a way you can do very easy bulk heading with that. So if you have a lot of actors that deal with SQL, for example, and your SQL database fails, you can propagate the errors back up to a parent, which only deals with SQL errors. And then it can, I don't know, switch to a different database, do some graceful degradation, anything goes. Um, so this is basically, in a way, it's a very nice way to deal with errors uh, in a point where it's really, really appropriate to deal with it. Uh, the third thing that's important or a core concept for Akka and also built on this active programming model is uh, called location transparency. Um, basically, what this is about is that um, in Akka, you don't really care if your actors are running on the same JVM, on different JVMs on your same computer, or basically the other actor might run in Japan while you are in Berlin. This is, doesn't make a big difference. You don't need to change, uh, change a lot of code uh, in your program, basically. Most of it is configuration, and then you can basically switch between, okay, I'm talking right in the JVM, or I'm talking through the network, with, of course, all the uh, yeah, fallacies of distributing computing we heard about in the first talk. So you do need to think about it a bit, but well, um, your program doesn't need to change much. And of course, uh, so in the program, the, call, uh, the talk is called uh, uh, Writing Microservices with Akka Streams, and Streams is what I will talk about now. Streams is a fairly um, new addition to Akka. Uh, so whereas Akka is uh, about 10, almost exactly 10 years now, um, Akka Streams came up uh, f five years ago. So it's, uh, well, not a really new addition, but it's something that evolved over time. And basically, why Akka Streams came up is um, that you saw a lot of the same problems being solved when implementing um, Akka, pro Akka applications. 
uh, because Akka is um, built for this message-driven uh, um, application style, basically. Um, so it's very good dealing with messages, with events flowing through it. And basically, one class of problem that always comes up is basically, OK, we want to deal with data streams. So not one individual message, but a series of message, messages that just keep coming in. Okay? And one of the typical problems you have when dealing with such, um, with such applications or mes message streams is that after a time, you can get into problems if your consumer is uh, slower than your producer. Okay? The messages keep on piling up. You have a mailbox that will buffer them, but some, at some point, the uh, message box is full. And then, OK, you have, to, you have two possibilities. You can have a bounded mailbox. Then, OK, messages just get dropped. Or you get some, at some point, if it's unbounded, uh, it, it will be bounded by your RAM. So basically, it w your program will crash. Um, and numerous people had to work around that problem, basically, in Akka. So at some point, the Akka team decided, OK, we've seen enough. Uh, we need to solve this basically at the, uh, basically at the Akka level. And what the Akka team did is they provided a different API, building on top of the, of the actor programming model, which basically provided a uniform way to deal with uh, streams. Um, yeah, so basically what uh, is at the center of, this, of Akka streams is a concept called basically the flow. Um, base, what the flow is, is a series of elements that can be put together. Um, each flow needs to have a source. A source is just an element that gets no input and produces output. All right? It has exactly one output. Uh, on the opposite side, of course, is a sync. This is basically just an element which takes element, which has one input but no output again. Um, and in between, you can have elements that have one input and one output. And basically, you can stack this together. So if you have a source and you put an element in front of it, um, you again have a composite source. Because you again have, if you look at a big picture, you again have something that's where nothing goes in and one element comes out. So using, using this, you can build in a very modular way um, basically your flows, which you can reuse at different uh, points in time. And actually, a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of what Akka's streams provides is built on this very simple concept where you get uh, much more powerful um, elements um, that can do a lot of stuff already for you uh, from, the f from the toolkit, um, which you don't have to implement yourself because you can just stack it together. Um, and one thing, so you, you can see the data flows in the one direction, and I was talking about this whole problem with what do you do with a slow consumer. You don't, in Akka streams, you don't only have one, or the data stream, which goes in one direction. What you have is a different stream going in the other direction. Okay? This is this demand stream, this dotted line I have here. Um, and basically what happens is that no producer is allowed to send data uh, basically without invitation. So what happens is that the sync will first signal, okay, I want to process a message. And then the element before the sync will say, OK, I have no messages. Let me signal that demand back to my source. And this goes through a complete flow until it reaches the source, and then the source produces one element. Um, as you can imagine, this is already a good way to deal with uh, the scenario of a slow consumer and a fast producer. Because whenever the consumer can't process any more messages, it will not signal demand, and the producer will be slowed down. But of course, this is not the only scenario where it exists. You can have also a, far, uh, um, a very fast consumer and a slow producer. And in that case, you would even slow down the producer more now, because you would just signal, OK, give me one message. Then the producer would send the message. You would consume it. You would process it. And then you would sin send another request for it. And this basically would add up with, this, um, basically with the slowness of the producer um, itself. Um, so what Akka Streams does is it can balance it out. So if you have a really um, fast consumer and a slow producer, the consumer will not signal one demand. It will signal demand for a lot of messages so that you can basically, the producer can send, I don't know, a thousand uh, messages in a row be without having to wait for a demand again. And so basically the system can balance out pretty good um, between these two states of push and pull in a way. All right. Um, now, this is very simple. So like I said, it's always one input, uh, zero one inputs and zero one, one outputs for this element. So you can't do really crazy stuff like broadcasting messages, merging everything back together, which is something you might want to do, actually. So if you're dealing with messages and data streams, you might want to do that. And also, of course, this is possible with Akka, and there's a different API for that, which is called the Graph API. And the fun thing about that is you can merge that back again into the flow. So in a way, you could imagine that this element in the middle, what it does, it's, it splits up the message into five messages, maybe. 
um, does some processing on each one of them, merges the results back together, and has one output again. And so this could be this element. So you can put this more complex logic also back into your Flow API. So it's very, very modular. You can do a lot of stuff with that. All right. This is um, Akka Streams in a nutshell. Um, Akka Streams was actually the beginning of something bigger, and uh, maybe you have heard about the Reactive Streams well, protocol. Um, it grew basically out of or parallel to Akka Streams, and it's basically something um, that other toolkit or other frameworks can also um, support. And by now, it's supported by a lot of different tools like uh, like Vertex or Arcs Java, um, and with this, you can talk with other applications through basically HTTP or whatever, and um, this back pressure, so basically this signaling back demand um, will go through the application boundaries, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so you can build really complex um, architectures with a lot of different systems, a lot of diff different technologies, uh, which are able to talk with, with each other. Um, since Java 9, uh, this, um, basically this, this API or basically this, this uh, protocol has made its way into Java as well. So this uh, Java flows thingy, that's reactive streams. Uh, so that can communicate with uh, Akka streams as well. All right. Um, next thing I want to talk about is Akka HTTP. Um, so as soon as the Akka team had Akka streams in place, uh, the next thing that came up was, uh, okay, this is pretty, a pretty good way to deal with data streams, but how do you get the data streams into your applications? And the most uh, common integration protocol is HTTP. So basically all the services you have do have REST APIs. Um, so supporting HTTP was very, uh, very important to the team. And they took one of the most popular Scala web frameworks, uh, which was called Spray, and rewrote it on top of Akka Streams. So basically what this provides you now is the ability to design REST APIs and basically connect them or process the data you, you consume from this um, REST API using Akka Streams. Um, so this is, of course, especially interesting if you have, like, um, po a post request or something like that with a big body that you can basically uh, um, uh, process using Akka Streams. Um, this is this is pretty pretty cool thing, and what's this, what's much more interesting even is uh, Project Alpaca. This is even younger. So Project Alpaca has been around for around two years now. Um, so with Akka HTTP, we've got the most common integration protocol covered. Okay, Akka HTTP, good. Um, but sometimes, and especially when dealing with data streams, you will want to consume or produce to other sources as well. Um, for example, Kafka or something like that. And that's where, where Project Alpaca comes in. Uh, Project Alpaca c provides a lot of different connectors. So, um, and it's really a lot. Uh, this is just a small subset of what's, uh, what is available right now. So you can connect to Kafka, you can connect to Mongo, you can connect to uh, Cassandra, a lot of AWS services, um, and even um, just old, plain old simple uh, relational data databases using JDBC. Um, so this is a pretty good way for your ACA applications to integrate with everything else you might have. All right, so um, one thing I want to talk to you about because I can't get too deep into the details of Akka. I uh, can't really show you really much code in this short time. But what I can do is I can suggest some scenarios where, in my experience, Akka is a good fit. Uh, so I've been working with Akka for n seven or eight years now, uh, and I've used it in a lot of different uh, scenarios, and especially in my last projects, we did a lot of microservice implementations with a lot of data streams. And um, yeah, basically, uh, this is what I want to suggest to you. <laughs> All right. So one usage scenario that I think Akka uh, HTTP is really good for if you have um, data streams which are um, basically which uh, are produced over HTTP. Or of course, uh, Kafka and anything else is also possible. But with, that is a problem that few web frameworks solve, uh, solve to, uh, um, in my opinion. Um, so every time you have, a, you have a, an interface which consumes data, and process this data line by line. So for example, you, have, you upload CSV files or something like that. Uh, this is something that's where Akka is, uh, is uh, ideally suited for that, because you can't, can start processing the file while it's still uploading. So in a way, you will never be forced to have the whole complete file in memory, which allows you, of course, for uh, uploading very big files, which might not always be the best idea, but sometimes you can't get around it, or even uploading a lot of files in parallel. 
So um, this, is, uh, this is something that is very useful. And of course, if you run into problems with processing this data, um, ArchiHTTP can back pressure it back. So basically what will happen is that for the, up, for, for the producer, for the uploader, it will look like the connection is very slow because it's not accepting packages as fast as they are produced. So this is pretty good if you want to have a really resilient um, service that can't be broken so easily by basically DOS attacks <laughs> uh, in a way. All right. Um, of course, so you can abstract from that and say REST services where, which have a high load are a good, uh, a good fit for ACA as well. And yes, of course. So anything um, where you really have a high number of requests is uh, something that ACA is really uh, suited for, especially when you have a high number of parallel requests. Um, what ACA does not is reserve a thread for each request you get. Instead, it has this actor implementation underneath. So basically, uh, you can, uh, there's not, not a real limit on how many requests can be processed in parallel, which is very, very, very nice. So in my, uh, in my old project, we had, um, we had an application which did exactly that. We needed a lot of parallel requests, and uh, we had around 1,000 requests per second on basically on my machine. So this, this works pretty well if you need it. Um, Especially what's, uh, what's a pretty good fit is uh, if you have uh, asynchronous uh, REST APIs. So, of course, you can do synchronous, so basically, you re really, after the request, we respond, uh, respond directly back. But if you need to do a bigger uh, processing in between, so you get the request, and then you do something with the data and tell your user, come back in five minutes, it, it will be ready, um, this programming model that ACA provides is very, good, uh, very well suited to that, also. All right, of course, Having mentioned uh, Project Alpaca, um, obviously it's a good fit for integration services. So basically, any time you need to connect, uh, you get data from A to B, uh, whatever A and B might, might be, you could use uh, uh, Akka with Project Alpaca. Um, other tools are also very useful there, like Apache Camel or, or Spring, um, Spring integ um, Integration. Um, in my opinion, Alpaca beats Camel. So in my old project, we switched from Camel to Alpaca um, for many reasons, to be honest. <laughs> All right. Um, something that's, of course, also very, um, you, can, you can do very easily is uh, uh, isolating internal interfaces. So, for example, if you have Kafka, you might not want to expose the Kafka brokers directly to the outside world. Um, and something we, for example, this was something that uh, we ran up, uh, a problem we ran up to. And uh, what we just did is basically put an HTTP interface uh, before the Kafka broker, have this ACA application that just transported um, each line into Kafka that we uh, received through this REST API. Um, this might not be the best idea in many scenarios. For us, it was the best solution, actually, and it worked really well because it was very easy to integrate with the service. You didn't need to know about Kafka. You didn't know to manage all these dependencies between Kafka versions and stuff like that. You just have to communicate via HTTP and REST, which every application can do. So that, was, um, that worked very well for us. Um, and of course, if you're in basically in between migrating from a monolith to microservice, you might also end up in a scenario where Akka can be, uh, especially Alpaca can be really um, useful. So if you have like old parts of a system which still needs uh, need to be communicated with, and maybe some old also some some different protocols that are used uh, there, um, this can be also a good solution in that in that, uh, um, in that scenario. Some other scenarios I want, don't want to go too deep into, but which also might fit are if you're using event sourcing or a secure S, especially for the command part in secure S, ECHA might be a very good fit. Uh, so I have, uh, I have heard from colleagues uh, who did very, had very good experience with that. Uh, bulk writes or reads to the databases, of course, as well. Um, so if you really need to, for example, we used ACA in a database migration from basically getting it from one database into the cloud, um, that might be an option. And to be honest, so like I said, I've been working for Akka for some time, and I'm, I might be considered a fan. So for me, anytime I have a lightweight uh, web or microservice I want to write, Akka is a choice. Um, basically, what's, what's really good about it is uh, that you can focus very, very much on the business logic, um, and the API does not too, add too much weight. So, in compar so if I compare the code of our uh, I don't know, Spring Boot services with our ACA services, so ACA was way less. I think uh, we're on 10% or something like that. All right, so this is basically the end. So to summarize, um, 
so this whole design, based uh, basing on this uh, actor programming model, uh, provides a lot of properties that are useful for microservices. You want resilience in your microservices. You might want this uh, whole location transparency thing when you are thinking about making a cluster uh, out of your application. Um, so this is something that works really well and this asynchronousy of, uh, of dealing with, uh, with, uh, with data or with messages. Um, it's really good when it comes to streaming. So this whole Akka Streams um, did a lot of good for the Akka ecosystem. So since adopting Akka Streams, Akka usage has really gone up. Um, it's being used in a lot of places by now. Um, but one final word of warning, um, Akka is good. It's, I think I like it very much. Uh, but the API is powerful. So it has some complexity. Um, it, was, it is not something that you will be just able to start and uh, basically play around with. You need to understand some core concepts first, especially Akka Streams has some complexity. The API is meant to be um, simple. It doesn't hide much magic. So basically, what you see is what happens. Uh, you have to, it's a very ex explicit API. So a lot of uh, uh, stuff you are doing, you will have to code and you will have to understand. Uh, it's ca it can be good in a way because it's not something uh, where you need to dive deep and understand what's happening underneath the code you wrote. Um, everything that happens is basically pretty clear from what you have, but still there are some concepts that, that are pretty hard to understand. So um, my experience with Akka is, is that it takes a, a good team about one and a half months to really get into this actor programming mindset of how that works, how passing messages works, and uh, around two or three months uh, to really get into Akka Streams, uh, to really uh, get familiar with, uh, with all the complexities and really understand how the more complex uh, um, concept worked. All right, that's it for me. Sorry for uh, being a bit too, too late. Thank you for your attention, and uh, yeah, happy hacking.